Good morning and welcome to Open Mics with Dr. Stites. It's Wednesday, September 28th and I'm Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control at the University of Kansas Health System and I'm sitting in for Dr. Stites this morning. Well, some call the COVID vaccines a miracle of modern science while others label them experimental and rushed. Even with another vaccine available or multiple vaccines available, many in the nation still struggle with the choice to even get one. Today we'll explore how these vaccines came about so quickly in this pandemic and where we're headed with vaccination as well. We've got an outstanding panel with us to do that and help us with that today. We wanna to welcome back Dr. Gregory Poland, joining us virtually. He's an infectious disease physician at Mayo Clinic and director of Mayo's Vaccine Research Group. And with us in the Dolph C. Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio is Rick Coldry, Vice President of Pharmacy and Health Professions here at the Health System. Welcome to you both. Happy to be here. All right, thank you. So questions from our viewers are vitally important for this show, an important part uh, overall of what we do. We wanna hear from you. So get yours, your questions sent in to us now on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and the Medical News Network. You will find links to those right here on your screen. And Jessica Lovell will join us a little later with those questions. And Dr. Hawkinson, um, we just lost Dr. Poland, so we're trying to get his connection back. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna let you um, just jump in with Rick Coltry. Yeah. Great. Hi, Rick. How are you? I'm great. How you doing, man? Good. good. So it's good to have you here. And I know we got a lot of information and questions about vaccines in general. Um, some, you know, one of these will kind of hold back a little bit, um, just talking about how they're adjusted for the new variants. But I uh, would like to also go to a question that is really, really uh, on the minds of, of, I think, most people, not just here, but the United States. And that is, um, is about flu shots. Sure. Do we know about flu shots? Can you get influenza vaccine the same time as you get your COVID vaccination or booster? A hundred percent. Absolutely. You can get those vaccines at the same time. Um, ideally, I think we'd all like if they're one injection, but we haven't got there yet. Maybe that'll be coming in the future. So you guys have to get two, two needle jabs. Nobody wants that, but you can get those vaccines at the same time. And actually, um, people ask me, I'm recommending just go ahead and get them both when you get your vaccine. If, if you get one, get the other one at the same time. It's just a little bit easier. So. so that being said, too, along with influenza vaccine, we know the influenza vaccine has changed every uh -huh. year. Absolutely. We know that recently there has been updated boosters. Can you tell us any difference? Uh, and how are these new COVID boosters? Again, we're talking specifically about the mRNA boosters from Pfizer and Moderna. Yeah. How are they different from what we have been using since these mRNA vaccines have come into uh, to practice? Yeah, um, and so Dana, I, I know you're, you have expertise, you know this too. Uh, essentially, those the boosters are designed to cover the newer variants um, up through Omicron, I believe, is where we're able to cover the COVID boosters, the, the newly formulated ones. So it is a lot like the flu vaccine. So every year, uh, the, the vaccine manufacturers are kind of watching the flu because it has this cycle around the globe and they're looking for specific strains and they're trying to adapt the vaccine to treat those specific strains of flu. So this is not really unlike that process. It's just for, it's for COVID vaccines. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. I think we should, should be clear on a couple processes exactly like you said. You know, every year the manufacturers try to look ahead six months because they get most of their information from the Southern Hemisphere influenza season. So they look, try to look ahead six months and change the influenza vaccine to the current circulating influenza viruses, just That's like right. you said. That's right. How has this changed now from uh, what we're doing with the updated boosters? And certainly Dr. Gregory uh, Poland will help us with that. But we would also like to say that it is anticipated and hoped that uh, using the new vaccine for the updated COVID booster is going to provide uh, even better protection than the current uh, or, or recently current uh, vaccine, the monovalent vaccine, which used the original Wuhan isolate spike, which, by the That's way, right. did continue to provide great protection against hospitalization, severe disease and death, especially those that were high risk and if you were up to date with the vaccine. So luckily now we have Dr. Poland back with us. It's good to see you, Dr. Poland. Thank um, you, Bob. Good to be with you. 
Yeah, so uh, right now we're just gonna really start and, and continue this conversation with the vaccines. The CDC reports nearly 265 million people in the United States have already received their first dose of COVID vaccine. We've heard just this week that about four and a half million have received the new bivalent booster, but 68 million Americans still have no vaccine. Does this concern you? Oh, no question. I mean, the death rate in people who have not been vaccinated uh, against COVID, that death rate is six times higher than in Americans who have been uh, immunized. Among pregnant women, the risk of COVID uh, is substantially increased and decreased with vaccination. Uh, the risks of complication after COVID, including long COVID, are substantially higher in people who become infected and are not vaccinated. So, uh, you know, short of not being able to vac be vaccinated for a medical reason, I, I just got to be honest with you, it's foolish to not be immunized. The people who are dying now of COVID are predominantly the unvaccinated. Yeah, and I so appreciate and love that answer. And I think, you know, we still, even early on, we had so many people who say, I like to do my own research. I want to I want to find this out. That research is publicly publicly available. And the vast, vast majority of uh, of that research describes exactly what you're saying. So thank you for doing that. In addition, we've discussed it from time to time. Uh, but Dr. Poland, can you please explain what we mean by bivalent booster? And we touched on it just briefly here before you got back on. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's a little confusing to people in some ways. People want to call it trivalent. So what it includes is the blueprint for the Wuhan spike and for the BA.4.5 spike. The really, reason it's called bivalent is because the receptor binding domain, that portion of the spike that touches a human cell and allows it to infect the cell, that receptor binding domain in BA.4 and BA.5 are identical. So you have that blueprint and the blueprint for the spike from Wuhan, which is why they call it bi or two valent. Exactly. Yeah, that was a very good, clear answer. Hopefully our, our viewers really enjoyed that. So thank you very much. Also, um, the relaxed guidance from the CDC mirrors the public mood on COVID. We know this. People are weary from COVID and the pandemic and all that. And for many people, it's over, you know, in their mind or how they live their daily life, and they don't care. But it's not over for healthcare, is it? No, not uh, it's it's not over for the public, and it's not over for healthcare. Uh, you know, just looking at the statistics this morning across the nation, there are uh, about twenty nine thousand people currently in the hospital with COVID, about thirty five hundred people in the ICUs and about 400 people a day are dying in America. So one of the things you hear people compare it to is influenza. And let me just make what I think will be a very stark difference. Last week, four people died of influenza in the US. Last week, 1,055 Americans died of COVID. So this is by no means over. Uh, you know, I completely agree. And this hits home your first point about being six times at greater risk of death if you are not up to date with your vaccine. So I think that is vitally important as well. So overall, we talked about the weariness and the pandemic is over. What do you think that attitude means for the future of the pandemic? And I know that there are different definitions for the pandemic, but let's talk about for here, our country, or even any of our, our particular communities. Yeah, Hawk, this is something that I've published on and spoken uh, quite a bit publicly on. Uh, I think this portends very bad things for America. Um, there is the sense that we have lost any sort of transcendent reference points upon which we can agree. People believe that they are expert in the science. Uh, and believe that that expertise is as great as yours or mine, where we've studied this our entire adult lives. Uh, so what does this mean going forward? Well, we've had four, what, four or five surges. We are very likely going to have another one this winter. 
Uh, one of the variants that we're keeping an eye on right now is called BA2.75.2. And the unfortunate thing about this variant is that it evades any prior immunity due to vaccines or due to illness um, <clears throat> and is resistant to every one of our monoclonal antibodies except BEV. So uh, this, is, this is a bad situation where people are complacent. And I believe once again, this is going to sneak up and catch everybody by surprise. And it needn't have, have that happen uh, this coming uh, winter as, as it gets cold and people are indoors and traveling. And on top of it, there'll be great concern because, uh, as you know, the Southern Hemisphere just came out of their winter mm -hmm. and they were yeah. walloped by influenza. And uh, I, I think part of what this means is that people are not getting vaccinated. They're, they're very lackadaisical about this. And unfortunately, it will be to their great harm. Yeah, I think that uh, is a great point. Looking at that individual, taking, uh, taking stock of your own risk as an individual, understanding, and that is part of what I think you and I both do at these academic uh, institutions, is teaching. So we are trying to teach the community, but also teaching individuals to understand the risk and be responsible to do the best that they can to prevent these problems. I think the other thing, like you just mentioned about influenza in the Southern Hemisphere, is that for the last couple of years, we have been concerned about that twindemic, if you will, with COVID-19 and influenza. This year, it looks to like, be like it could be very real. Luckily, like you said, in the United States right now, activity and flu deaths are extremely low, but it doesn't take much time for that to ramp up. So shifting exactly. gears a little bit as well, when it comes to masking, as we had talked about, you know, kind of COVID weariness, most people have stopped. Should we be going back to masking in specific places like airports, airplanes, sporting events, concerts? What about places of work? What are your feelings on that? Yeah, there is no doubt in my mind that a rational examination of the data would say that when you are indoors mm -hmm. among people who are not your family, you're wearing a proper mask properly. Um, and it is it is shocking. I've, I have of necessity had to do a fair amount of travel internationally and nationally in the last couple of months. And, you know, usually the only people in a mask are myself, my wife and yeah. less than one percent of, of anybody else. And, and that is to our detriment. So I think in the healthcare setting, in the crowded indoor venue setting, absolutely. If you want to protect yourself wear a mask. I'm in this thing all day long. It is very doable. It's not fun, but it's better than being infected and suffering the consequences of that. Yeah, you know, I think that's a great point. I think, you know, maybe people weren't doing it in the spring and summer when uh, specifically if they were traveling maybe or going places, just like you said. It may be reasonable to rethink that. We know certainly in the hospital and certain units um, for a decade or more, we've been masking during respiratory viral season. Just as you said, if you're traveling, it would probably behoove that individual while in the airport or the airplane or wherever they might be to wear that mask so that they can stay healthy, at least for their vacation or where they're traveling to. But even much more importantly, to uh, not suffer the consequences of that, that hospitalization and severe disease. So I think that is a very good point. You know, we, we were talking, Hawk, in the doctor's lounge and making the point that if none of this had happened and suddenly you and I were on today announcing the circulation of a new virus that nobody had heard about and that it was expected to take four to 500 uh, people, uh, deaths per day. Uh, you can only imagine, manage the, imagine the kind of panic that would occur. People would be willing to do anything like wear a mask or get a vaccine. So what's happened here is intellectually and irrationally, people are, as you said, fatigued of this. But let me just say, the virus could care less how fatigued we are of this. It will take advantage of this. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, we're going now to what is our best means of protection? Obviously, those non-pharmaceutical interventions like you talked about, showing that mask. But we also have these medical interventions, these vaccines. 
Unfortunately, many people, even though we are two to three years out now from the, the rollout of these vaccines, many people think these vaccines were rushed and experimental. And a lot of vaccines do take years to develop for multiple reasons. But explain how these particular vaccines, and I think we're really focusing right now on the mRNA vaccines. Certainly we know there are the viral vector vaccines and, and the protein subunit, the Novavax. Uh, but explain how these were developed in less than a year and why there's nothing experimental about them. Yeah, that's a great question, one, one I get asked a lot. So, mm -hmm. you know, mRNA was discovered and began to be exploited scientifically in 1960. Okay, by 1990, mRNA vaccines were starting to be developed. There was no particular need for them until 2003 with SARS-CoV-1, and vaccines were developed, uh, at least in the initial phases of development, uh, for SARS-CoV-1 using mRNA technology. SARS-CoV-1 basically went away. The technology was put on the shelf until 20. Uh, 12, when we had MERS redeveloped, MERS did not develop into the pandemic that we thought that technology was shelved again. So when uh, SARS-CoV-2 came along, this was sitting there ready to go. Now, what feels fast to people is the uh, clinical trial development phases of the vaccine. And those were appropriately rushed. What do I mean by that? It's instead of taking three, four, five years to get together all the administrative things that you have to do to study a vaccine uh, involving tens of thousands of people, there was massive cooperation at the FDA level, at the academic investigator level, at the international level, all of which enabled the rapid study uh, for safety and efficacy of the vaccine. So. That this is the problem with uh, people who say, I, I want to do my own research. They go to University of Google <laughs> and spend an hour or two, and, and they think they understand the nuances of this. And, and worse, they become very fixed in their beliefs, making it hard to, uh, to, to move those beliefs in a different direction. And of course, on top of it, I think there were a lot of uh, uh, political and public health miscommunications. But uh, in, 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 a, in a scientific way of thinking, there, there would be no data to suggest that these were rushed. These were in development and, uh, as I say, appropriately taken advantage of. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any TikTok or, or Twitter posts that are recommended scientific or medical education. So I think that's a great point. The other <laughs> point that you, that you made so distinctly is uh, the cooperation, but also that resource, that funding resource that was able yes. to get this yes. done, and that drove it all. So uh, excellent points. But now as we look ahead to winter, the past two years, we've seen big surges in COVID. When we're all inside, we're all together doing these things because it's difficult to go outside, especially in the northern areas of the country. Do you think we're in for the same this year or can we break this cycle? Are we beginning now to get into more of a respiratory viral season cycle with SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, predictions are always hazardous. Uh, but here's my predict prediction. One of two scenarios. If we don't have new variants come or those variants are less able to evade immunity, maybe we'll start to glide toward a more normal path. I think the more likely scenario, given what we're starting to see around the world and the lackadaisical attitude that people have, is that there will be a massive pent up demand for holiday travel. People won't be wearing masks. The immunization rate is low, the booster rate even lower, and for those, and the development of new variants is happening now. So the more likely scenario in my mind is that we're going to have, as you, as you appropriately called it, Hawk, a twindemic. Actually, we might even say tridemic. I think we're going to have influenza. We've already started to see a surge in RSV cases. 
and COVID cases as these new variants learn to evade our, our immunity due to past illness and due to vaccines. Yeah, you know, I think life for us as infectious disease physicians is only going to get more important. Not only the RSV like you talked about, there was recently MMWR out of CDC, uh, the report about the increase in um, uh, uh, rhino or enterovirus D68 yeah. as well. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think it could be uh, difficult for both adults and, and pediatric patients this year. Um, sure. And so, uh, you know, I also want to touch on this question has come up multiple times. And we always hear about the virus is becoming resistant to the vaccine. And I'd like to just have you answer this, but maybe touch on uh, what that means by resistance and just also in the context of understanding uh, what are those arms of our immune system, both those antibodies, which you had mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago, but also those, those, those T cell immune responses as well. So is the virus becoming resistant to the vaccine? So, so yes and no, and this is where the nuance comes in. So um, the vaccines that we have gotten continue to protect us at extraordinarily high levels against death, severe disease, uh, mechanical ventilation, and even hospitalization. It protects much less well against moderate, mild, and asymptomatic disease even less well against transmission. That's a fact about all of the current COVID vaccines. We just have to learn to live with that probably until we develop mucosal based vaccines like nasal spray or oral tablet vaccines. Um, so, so there's nuance there when we talk about are they evading? Now, what does evading mean? What it, what it means is that the, the, at whatever given level of antibody you have, the effectiveness of that antibody in protecting you is diminished by these new variants. Let me give you an example. With BA 2.75.2, mm -hmm. the effectiveness of whatever level of antibody I have mm -hmm. from getting all my vaccines is decreased about 500 fold in the face of BA 2.75.2, meaning that because of that variant, because of waning over time, I will become susceptible again. Not to death, not to severe disease, that protection remains. And this touches, uh, Hawk, on what you were saying about the arms of immunity. So for simplicity's sake, I'll just take two of them, antibody and cellular immunity. So protection against infection is primarily antibody mediated. Protection against disease is primarily cellular uh, uh, mediated. And those, that cellular immunity stays intact uh, and protects us. That's why even though I may become susceptible again to infection, I'm really not susceptible to hospitalization or death. That, that's maintained over the long term. Now, how long, we don't know, but the good news is by getting these boosters, we boost not only our antibody, albeit temporarily, but we greatly boost our cellular immunity, which lasts a long time before it begins to wane. You know, great points, and I want to touch on just two of them. Number one, you said about how the antibodies decrease, and earlier it was subtle when you said the antibodies wane. And I think that is certainly true. We know that with natural infection or vaccination, those antibodies can uh, wane or contract. Uh, I think the, the general public needs to understand that this is a normal process. And so when they see yeah. articles about that, it's very important to understand that that is a normal process of our immune system. And you said that twice, and I think we just need to, to hammer that home uh, more to the community. The other issue is you talked about the cellular, the T cell immunity, how long that lasts. And I think that's important and vitally, uh, to, uh, vitally uh, important to understand because the best thing that we know, the best data support the fact that in all of these spikes from these different variants, those T cell epitopes or areas that our, our T cells recognize are really 80% or more conserved even yes. throughout those variants. Yes. And so uh, I think those are two points that you made that are great that I would just like our community to really understand 
and we want to hammer home those points. So kind of switching now just to, uh, to Rick, uh, our guest here uh, in studio. Uh, Rick, we want to remind everyone that when it comes to boosters, it's okay to mix and match vaccines from different manufacturers. Sure. So we know recently there is or was a shortage of the Moderna booster manufacturing, but with that shortage resolved, what is our supply of all the boosters in the health system at this time? And any ideas uh, about the supplies in the pharmacies and the doctor's offices around town as well? Yeah, no, thanks, thanks, Dana. Yeah, I didn't even like the term mix and match vaccines. You know, uh, really <laughs> it makes it sound like you might be doing something wrong because you're mixing things up. But really, getting vaccinated uh, when at the right time when you're supposed to get vaccinated is the most important thing. It doesn't matter what the brand name is. They all have great effectiveness, as you guys both know. So, uh, yeah, just, just get your vaccine. As far as supply goes, uh, you know, earlier, you know, Danny asked me a question about how we were getting the vaccine. It actually is still coming through the government. It's still coming through the federal government to the state governments and being distributed that way. So uh, there was a bit of a delay for our supply getting in, into the health system, but it is here now and we are ready to go. So I don't know of any other supply delays right now with, with versus demand. Yeah. It would be great if we were running out because so many people wanted to get vaccinated, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, but right now, there's no, no right. issues with supply delay. So, so Dr. Poland, really quick, any concerns or comments about the nuances of maybe mixing and matching as we're using that term right now for these particular COVID-19 vaccines? Yeah, as Rick said, there's no problem with doing that at all. And in fact, the data tends to a slight positive tilt to doing a mix and match. In other words, if you got it all Pfizer, get a Moderna booster. If you got all Moderna, get a Pfizer booster. There seems to be some benefit in that. All right, great. Well, you, hear, you heard it here. So I think you are helping our community and, and all the viewers mm -hmm. around, thank That's you. Right. So also we've been saying for a long time on this program that it's okay uh, to get your flu shot and your COVID booster at the same time. When is the best time to get them both? Uh, soon as they are available to you. <laughs> do, do, don't delay. That yeah. would be uh, that would be my take. Um, you know, typically we start getting flu vaccines anytime from uh, mid September to uh, the end of October, but we don't really mm -hmm. stop doing that, Dana. You know, until yeah. um, deep into the winter. Yeah. You know, when it's no longer effective. So, and Dr. Poland, we, we know the CDC recommends never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Right. What, are, what is your opinion or maybe what do you tell some of your patients? Obviously you have a different patient mix with some immunosuppressed, some that aren't. What about timing of say a booster or influenza vaccine or both of them as we are sitting here today? Yeah, so you know, maybe a bit of a nuance and, and Hawk, you're, you're right. What we do at a public health level can be different when we uh, personalize it to the individual. So uh, because of where COVID is right now, I would recommend getting your COVID booster, as, as Rick said, as soon as it's available. Now, what about influenza? We really don't have much influenza now, but remember, once you get your flu vaccine, it's about two plus weeks mm -hmm. before you're really at protective levels of, of antibody. So if, if you're one that is unlikely to come back for a flu vaccine, I would give it now if you had the opportunity. For an older, more frail person, remember that the, uh, the, the peaks of our influenza outbreaks usually are in the January, February timeframe. I mention that because many people think that if they don't get it by Thanksgiving, it's too late and they don't need to bother with it. Um, I think you do need to bother with it. And I think the best time to get it is in that mid-September to end of October timeframe. I would probably tilt more toward October mm -hmm. unless there was a demonstration of transmission of virus going on. Yeah, you but know, that's, I think that's, that's a nuance. Yeah. I, I think that's great. And, and I love that nuance because it is important because you want that full maximal immunity throughout the bulk of the influenza period. And so I think... You know, it is unfortunate, it's not just a blanket statement, but it is also taking into account influenza activity. So, you know, thank you for that. And it's you also know, the other thing worth, worth mentioning because people tend to forget about it is for viewers that are uh, like me, age 65 and older, there are mm -hmm. specific vaccines 
geared toward older Americans because our immune systems don't work as well as they did when we were in our 20s and 30s. Uh, you know, I think that's great too. And hopefully the pharmacy you go to or your medical team or your physician is going to understand those and get you the right vaccine. Exactly. That high dose flu vaccine is vitally important. Right. So, so Rick, today, uh, this is the first day that patients uh, in the health system can get their flu shot. What do they need to do to get one? And are there any specific requirements? Sure. That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> You know, Dana, we have been for many years, decades, hmm. as you know, uh, working really hard to make the flu vaccine widely available and easily accessible throughout the health system for our employees and patients. And so, um, you know, any of our, our really primary care providers, we give to vaccines to patients who are eligible for them, who, has a, who are going to have a good immune response uh, vaccine before their discharge. I know you already know this. You've, mm -hmm. you've done this for years as well. Uh, and then we're working really hard to make it easy for our employees to get vaccinated too. So uh, there's lots of information out there. There's too many places for me to talk about yeah. where you yeah. can go to get vaccinated yeah. in the health system. So uh, just pay attention to uh, any communications for our employees here um, as patients out in the, out in the market. Uh, and like I said, our primary care providers, your physicians usually go to a clinic. We're all going to have vaccines available for you. And I, I, what I would say, honestly, though, as a, as a pharmacist, wherever you can go that's convenient, uh, that works for you. So don't, don't put an extra hurdle of going somewhere specific to get your vaccine. If you can go somewhere and it's a, you know, a, a pharmacy that's local, it's close by, or a health clinic that's doing a you know, free, free, flu, free flu shot day, mm -hmm. d it, whatever works for you that's a reputable source, just that's easy get it done that's what i would say yeah great advice all right well you know everybody is waiting with bated breath for today's covid count so we'll talk about that now and right now in the health system we have 26 active patients with two in the icu one on the ventilator and 24 in that recovery period i'd just like to take a minute to say that um, unfortunately, our hospital numbers have still been fairly high. We've seen a decrease right now into that mid-20s, but they were staying in, in that lower 30s. Um, again, m the vast majority of these people are not vaccinated or not up to date. Uh, Dr. Poland, just wondering, do you know about any trends uh, where you're at? Because we know that in general, r around the United States, reported cases are going down, but hospitalizations are as well. So I'm hoping with this, this uh, number today for us, we'll start a new trend and have that decrease in our hospitalizations because we are only testing people that are showing symptoms. We are not testing everybody that comes into the hospital. Yeah, same with us, Hawk, and, and very reflective of what your experience is. That's not been true everywhere, however. Uh, Indiana and uh, uh, more importantly, Kentucky and a few other hot spots are not experiencing quite the same decreases, but nationally, uh, I would say that um, hospitalizations, deaths, et cetera, are down about uh, 15 to 20 percent overall. All right. Well, yeah, thank you. Uh, also, okay, so today we are finally getting to reporter questions and community questions. Any reporter questions? No. Jessica. I know. Okay, so we've, of course, Dr. Poland is a very popular guest, yes. so so we've got, and they're very happy that he's back on today. So I just wanted to jump in with a couple of questions. Dr. Poland, Isaac said he's a little sad. Mm -hmm. You've made him feel a little sad because he wants to feel like that we're going to have a normal Christmas, a normal Thanksgiving once again someday in the future. Um, is that something you can promise? What are your thoughts? <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be the Grinch here, Isaac. I know. <laughs> I, I, my guess is this year will not be that year, but in the, we will get back. We will get back to something more normal. But I, but I do want to stress, it's going to be a new normal. We are not going to ever be rid of coronavirus. You know, once, once the 1918 influenza pandemic hit, we have had yearly epidemics of influenza. I believe the same thing is likely with coronavirus. Just as a reminder, when you get your flu shot now, you're getting a component that mirrors the 1918 virus. So over 100 years later, 
we're, we are in essence still immunizing against that. So, you know, your great, great grandchildren, uh, unfortunately, are going to be getting coronavirus vaccines. And we're going to have an increase in the number of annual respiratory deaths that we have. It's estimated that we will probably end up around 100,000 uh, additional respiratory deaths each year due to coronavirus. And the hardest part about that is convincing people of the importance of, of getting vaccinated and taking appropriate precautions. So again, I don't wanna be a Grinch. The way I live my life is to say to other people, go out and live your life. Do the things that you love, but do them safely. Do them wisely. Well said, yeah. Dr. Poland. Also, Joellen wants to know, she's curious what you think when you hear about evacuations due to disasters like Ian possibly hitting today here mm -hmm. very shortly. Mm -hmm. As far as what do you think effect does that have when it comes to these folks moving out of that area and into another area and, yeah. and possibly the spread? Um, is that something that concerns you or that should concern other people? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's not just travel, it's anything that causes people to, to move. Uh, I'm concerned about this for Europe with the Ukrainian refugees who already had a, a suppressed immunization rate. And, and by the way, as, as Hawkwell knows, and I've heard him talk about it too, is this has disrupted other childhood vaccines that we give. And that puts us at risk. I, I'm sure people are aware of the polio case uh, in New York, just one example of uh, why we have to be vigilant and stay on top of immunizations. Rick, Kathy wants to make sure she heard you right. Are you saying I should now get Pfizer if I've had all Moderna vaccines? She's gonna get her booster this week and her flu shot, but she just wants to make sure that that is what you said. Good <clears throat> to go? Yeah, I'm actually gonna mix two responses here okay. because uh, Dr. Poland actually pointed out that there, I believe you said, Dr. Poland, there's a slight uh, evidence in the data that mixing Moderna and Pfizer can have a, a little bit of a, bo a benefit for you. Um, that's great. My, my point, I, I think Dr. Poland would nod on this one too, is that's not a, don't use that as a reason to delay or miss or anything right. else getting your vaccine. Just get your vaccine. That's not necessarily a definitive piece of information on how you should make choices. It's just a, if you mix them up, hey, maybe you'll get a little bit extra out of it, that a little bit extra protection. That's great. But the, the point is stay on top of your vaccine. Just get them. Absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah. Get agree. them. <laughs> Dr. Poland, Janet wants to know what you think of Evusheld injections for the immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. Uh, a great uh, strategy for them. Uh, Evusheld is very safe. Uh, it's two doses, one in each butt cheek. Um, <laughs> the only concern I have is uh, the only concern I have is that uh, it may not work well against some of the coming variants mm -hmm. like BA 2.75.2. But right now a great strategy for people who are immunocompromised or people who cannot get uh, either of the currently approved three vaccines available in the US. There are some people who have had side effects such that they can't get boosted or, or can't complete their series. And Evusheld is an option for them too. Dr. Poland, Pamela says, I heard on the news that if you haven't had the first two shots, that you need to have those before the new shot. Why does it matter if you've not had the first shot? Are they different? Well, yes. I mean, the first, the, the, the original series that we all got was based off the Wuhan strain. So the recommendation was complete your uh, original series and then get these boosters. That may well be uh, altered in the future, but right now, remember that the boosters are at a lower dose than the original uh, primary series. So that's why the discrepancy, but good pickup for that yeah, listener. Absolutely. Dr. Hawkinson, uh, yeah. uh, clear this up for Elena, because we get this question probably, I would say almost daily. Yeah. So people want to know, I've had my three shots totaling yeah. um, last 
uh, December, so about a year ago, just tested positive for the first time two yeah. weeks ago, and now I'm symptom free. When should I get that booster? Yeah, again, so I think we have two points, and I'm going to let uh, Dr. Poland extrapolate on this, but number one, CDC recommendations, never miss an opportunity to vaccinate, and you can get <laughs> vaccinated after you're out of isolation, but there is also that updated recommendation. I think this is vitally true as well. You have now had a natural infection boost, so you are now getting an immune response to not only spike, which is in the vaccine, but also those other components of the virus. You probably have BA5, which is, I think, the highest or more dominant circulating virus in the United States. There is that consideration from the CDC to wait up to 90 days to get the vaccine. I am recommending to my patients to wait that eight to 12 weeks, that's 60 to, uh, to 90 days, to go ahead and then get that booster dose of vaccine. And why? Also, at that point, you're going to be closer to the holidays, and that is going to provide you even more maximal protection, just as Dr. Poland was saying, that increase in antibodies to maybe have an, a little bit of an added benefit of protection against infection, uh, even if it's minimal. But I think the recommendation by most experts would be to wait eight to 12 weeks after your acute illness. And I'll let Dr. Uh, Poland uh, answer. I absolutely agree with you, Hawk. That's uh, my own practice too. I think that makes the most sense and is rational. Yeah, great question. Okay, Kathy has a question. She had this one sent in yesterday, mm. knowing that Dr. Poland was going to be on this morning. So they were, <laughs> were ready, ready for, for you. you. They were ready for <laughs> you. Okay. <laughs> Kay says, my friend has had pancreatic cancer for five years now and has been symptomatic and positive for COVID for three and a half weeks. She is still testing positive, but should she get the new bivalent booster soon or wait to two to three months? I think I already know the answer to this one, mm. but um, also... Uh, she's a senior citizen, immun immunocompromised, um, just wanting to know that timing. I, I think when you put all those factors together, yeah. Dr. Poland, um, people yeah. always want to know when is that perfect sweet spot to get that shot? Yeah, um, a tough, tough one in this yeah. case Complex. because there are nuances around mm -hmm. the clinical picture here. And I'm, I'm not trying to defer it, but I would say this is a case where you really need to talk with an ID physician uh, not necessarily your, gen your general practitioner, but an ID physician, because this may also be a case where Evusheld may be important, depending on if she is receiving chemotherapy, how immunocompromised is she, et cetera. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that question raised flags in both our, our minds as soon as we heard it about the continuing to test positive, but more importantly, that immunosuppressed status. So I think it's vitally important to talk with your uh, medical team that's Di uh, that's using the immunosuppression and who who's prescribing it for you. And then if you can, maybe just get a, a comment from an infectious disease physician. We know those people that are immunocompromised can have continued uh, replication of the virus. It also depends, are you having symptoms, et cetera? What are you testing? Are you testing PCR? Are you testing antigen? So there are a lot of nuances there, just as Dr. Poland said. So similar type of question. Sarah is asking, my husband is currently going through treatment, taking steroids for his yeah. autoimmune disease. Should he yeah. get his bivalent booster right now or wait until he's done with treatment? Mm -hmm. Is that another ask your doctor <laughs> question? Dr. Poland. Okay. Oh, doctor, uh, we're gonna get him unfrozen in a moment. Yeah. But uh, what would you advise yeah, in that case? I think so, again, complexities to this. How much prednisone are you on? Are you on any other agents? What else are you on? Um, what is your history with the vaccines or infections, meaning have you received all the doses? Have you been infected? So there are quite a bit of nuances uh, to this individual question. It's a very good and insightful question, but I think it's difficult to put, paint a broad stroke to, to make that answer for sure. And then I think I'm gonna give the last question uh, to you, Dr. Hawkinson. Elena has a follow-up mm -hmm. question because her two-year-old caught COVID between her first and second shot. Mm -hmm. This was just a few weeks ago. When should she get that second shot? I mean, do we know, do, is it any different between adults and, and young kids? No, I think, again, she's going to get that, that natural boost uh, from the infection. So she will probably have that, what we've heard in, in the media is that hybrid immunity. So you're getting immune responses to spike, which we know is most important and is in uh, the vaccines, but also to those other components of the vaccine as well. We know those 
quote unquote hybrid immunity and the patients who have that really have pretty good protection. Again, I would continue to wait um, for that eight to 12 weeks. And I think uh, your child would probably like it because it's, it, it's delaying that shot. So uh, <laughs> I think that's, that's the best advice is if you've been infected, really waiting that eight to 12 weeks to get that, that other dose. And let me just sneak this last one in from Andy. He just uh, sent this in. Can my 22 year old go ahead and get the fourth shot? We were, you know, for a while there, it was the 50 and older getting yeah. that fourth shot. 22, good mm -hmm. to go? Yeah, right now um, it is 12 and above can get the booster. If you are uh, 12 to 18, you can get Pfizer. If you are 18 and above, you can get Moderna or Pfizer. So it's just understanding that age group and that nuance. Rick, anything to add to that? No, I was just thinking through my head. <laughs> yeah. So, but <laughs> the they age could... groups, I'm like, wow, Dana knows these age groups off the top of his head. Well, so uh, when we say booster, <laughs> you mean the second, so not the third, not the your first two doses, then you get your booster. Can 12 and over get that fourth shot the way that 50 and older were needing to get? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So the CDC has really simplified uh, the vaccine and dosing. And right now it's just completing that primary series. Um, so for very young children, uh, for Pfizer, you're getting three doses. For Moderna, you're getting two. For immunocompromised adults, you're getting three doses for that primary series. And then it's really just a booster now after that. So they've really simplified who can get what and in what time frame. And I think we have Dr. Pullen back. So any, any further questions? Well, he for came him? back just in time for our final thought. <laughs> so he's making- I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry we had a power uh, little sag there. So my apologies. <laughs> that happens. So Dr. Hawkinson, I'm gonna wrap up questions from our community and let you get final thoughts for our guests today. Yeah. So we'll start with Dr. Polin. Uh, you know, obviously people were waiting in the wings and had mm -hmm. some questions for you. It's, uh, it's always good to, to hear your answers. Any final thoughts today? You know, uh, Hawk, I, I, as I reflect back over this, and I'm sure it's true with you, just terrible stories from my patients and from others that I've consulted with. Not, not one of these families thought that a family member would die of COVID or would be in the ICU or even young patients of mine. I mean, vigorous, beautiful young people who now can't go back to school or can't work because of complications from COVID. I, I would just, with everything in me, emotionally plead with people, please, take appropriate precautions with masking, please get immunized and get your booster. It is the very best thing that you can do. If you have concerns or questions about that, please look at credible sources, the website of any academic medical center, any credible uh, physician will give you the same information and I, I just think that's so important, not only to protect your health, but to protect one surge against one surge after another, which I believe we are likely to have yet again this fall. And it's completely preventable. And thank you for that. And Rick, final words? <clears throat> yeah, um, for my final word, I wanna ask Dr. Pullen a question. <laughs> so we talked about two things today, uh, being immunized, and uh, other precautions like you masking. So if you were to prioritize what you'd want people to do or what to focus on, if you have someone who is really challenged or perhaps really even resistant to these measures and you could only focus on trying to get one, what would you prioritize? It, it would be getting vaccinated. I mean, yeah. th th this is, this is the most important thing you can do in protecting yourself against death, against severe disease and the damage. This is, this is a biologically destructive virus. Yeah. It truly yeah. is. I have never seen something like this in my 40 year career. So I would really focus on that and work with them. You know, you've got three, well, you've got four options actually. Two mRNA vaccines, an ad vectored vaccine, and now just recently, the Novavax uh, protein platform based vaccine. So there are great options that fit every medical uh, nuance that you can think of, including, as we talked about, Evusheld and then antiviral. 
Well, it looks All like right. we may be locked up with Dr. Poland again. So I'm just going to add on to what he's talking about. I expected he'd talk about getting vaccinated. Um, he talked about going to a credible resource, or academic medical site, or a credible physician. I'm, I'm going to add on, as I'm a pharmacist, also a credible pharmacist. Uh, mm -hmm. The vaccines have been largely dis distributed through pharmacies uh, through, throughout the pandemic. I think your pharmacist can be a great resource for this information as well. And um, on a more like me personal note, Dr. Poland talked about Novavax is available. I know some folks had particular concerns or um, moral religious concerns around how the, some of the vaccines were developed and Novavax is developed in a little bit different way. So that would be a potential thing to talk about. And just um, all of us have to be incredibly inquisitive, curious and respectful of everyone's opinions when we talk about vaccines to try to get as many voices heard and get as many people as we can vaccinated. Rick, I'm glad you brought that up because I was really surprised to hear Dr. Poland really drive home the message. Yeah. If you're going to be inside, if you're going to be in big crowds with people that are not your family, you don't know where they've been, mm -hmm. to put that mask back on. So that was a kind of eye-opening for me. I'm just curious. Were you, I was kind of surprised to hear him say that, but makes you think, right? Yeah. Can I have some final thoughts, Dr. Hawkins? Yeah, I would just like to continue <laughs> to reinforce what our guest Dr. Poland has said today. Please get that message out to, to your loved ones and your family members and your friends. Such vitally important information to help preserve your life, preserve uh, your, your quality of life, and really help you to continue to, to move through uh, in a safe and healthy manner. So I just can't thank him enough, and I, I know that, that our viewers uh, really appreciate him as well. Okay, so I have some final thoughts that are a little bit different today. Mm. I want to introduce a new segment that you may be seeing time to time, and it's taking you kind of behind the scenes. Who doesn't love going behind the scenes, right? And the hospital can be kind of a mystery sometimes. So today we are wheeling in change to make patients feel more comfortable and safer here at the health system. More than 700 new beds are being installed around the hospital. It's something you kind of might take for granted when you just show up here, you know, you're always gonna get a hospital bed when you show up here. But this new Striker Procuity bed that comes with a gel mattress might even be better than the one you have at home, or hoping so, making it way more comfortable for patients. It's got all the features that you'd expect to see, but these new beds are also allowing you to sit up like it's a chair, so it goes from bed to chair, and then it's got all the bells and whistles, a built-in phone charger, wireless connectivity, totally up to date. Uh, but we heard from a nurse here, though, who, who says that the new beds also make it so that their job is much easier in a lot of ways. They've helped so much. Um, that turn function on the bed here that she was just talking about is so helpful. Trying to shift their weight every two hours can be hard on our backs sometimes. Um, so having that extra help has been amazing. Well, dozens of employees from several departments are working together to replace all the beds, and that work will wrap up on Friday. Make it nice and comfy and cozy for you. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Dr. Stites will be back next Wednesday with another edition of Show Me the Science. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hawkinson, for filling in and Rick and Dr. Poland. Such a great topic and great conversation and great questions from our audience as always. And um, we just want to see you back here tomorrow at eight. So we'll see you back here for another edition of the Morning Medical Update. Have a great day. Coming up tomorrow on the Morning Medical Update, more than 82 million Americans have some sort of heart condition. I'm Jessica Lovell. Thursday is World Heart Day. Hear remarkable stories from a panel of patients benefiting from the latest therapies and technologies that cardiovascular care has to offer. Join us on the Morning Medical Update at 8. I'm Alexis Del Cid on the next All Things Heart. A few years ago, I thought I lost him. Horrible pain had his doctor stumped and his wife so worried. The diagnosis and the life-changing surgery, what you need to know if it happens to you, Thursday at 10. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now, everywhere podcasts are available. Thank you.